The Whistler 101 Sessions, a series that seeks to inform, educate, and inspire. Whistler 101, what do you know? Hi, I'm geologist Dr. Steve Kwong, and I'm going to explore with you how geodiversity in Whistler is about more than just rocks beneath our feet. Let's answer your first question. What is geodiversity? In the same way biodiversity measures the complexity of an ecosystem, geodiversity is a measure of the complexity of a landscape, the type of landforms present and their origin. This is important because geodiversity affects many things. For instance, as a low mountain pass between the coast and interior, the Whistler Valley was a shared hunting and meeting place for the Squamish and Lilwat First Nations for thousands of years. When European settlers arrived, geodiversity influenced the economies of logging, mining, tourism, and recreation. Geodiversity has inspired visual art, as well as music, writing, photography, and film. Most importantly, geodiversity influences biodiversity in many ways. So, given its importance, I can confidently say that geodiversity is the bedrock on which the environment and human existence depend. Now, to understand how it works, let's look at the bigger picture. At a global scale, plate tectonics shape the Earth's surface. Whistler and the surrounding area contain well-preserved evidence of this story. As the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate descends beneath the North American plate, compression has created a north-south mountain range, the Coast Mountains, as well as a chain of volcanoes that are part of the larger Pacific Ring of Fire. This is our orientation in space, but how has it evolved over time? Over geologic time, four pillars have created the geodiversity of the Sea to Sky Corridor. The mountains here are the result of hundreds of millions of years of geologic activity. Over the past 2.5 million years, continental ice sheets have further shaped the landscape. The interaction of volcanic eruptions and glacial ice have created landforms unique to the Whistler area. And finally, mountain building, glaciation, and volcanism have all combined with extreme coastal weather to create landslides, avalanches, earthquakes, and other hazards of a collapsing landscape. Given such a dynamic landscape, what can the Sea to Sky region expect going into the future? Let's find out by looking at each pillar in more detail. Whistler's mountains are what bring people here to spend a weekend, a season, or a lifetime. Most of us focus on mountains as something to hike up or ski down, but they also hold an immense amount of geologic information. The processes responsible for the mountains around Whistler have occurred over a time span of 250 million years. In this reconstruction, the Whistler area is marked by a yellow star. The information held in Whistler's rocks tells us that at different times, they have been under deep ocean water, locked in a shallow marine basin, part of an island chain, and sat high above sea level, locked in ice. For instance, these three familiar mountains are each composed of rocks of widely different ages. Fissile Peak is made of 250 million year old sediments. Blackcomb Mountain is 150 million year old crystallized magma. And the youngest of them all, Whistler Mountain, tells an eclectic 80 million year old story of deep water sediments, fossils, and ancient volcanoes. You can also see the Fitzsimmons Valley between Whistler and Blackcomb, now traversed by the peak to peak gondola. This represents a fault. In cross-section, you can see how the older rocks of Blackcomb and Fissile that were once below the younger rocks of Whistler are now side by side with them. The south side of the fault has dropped down, placing the younger rocks at a lower elevation, resulting in the vast diversity of rocks found just above Whistler Village. To the north and south of the Juan de Fuca plate, the Queen Charlotte and San Andreas faults continue the trend of earthquakes and eruptions along the Ring of Fire. In addition, the Coast Mountains are currently growing approximately two millimeters per year, 
in part because of continued uplift from these plate collisions and in part because the land is still rebounding after the last glaciation, the next pillar in our geodiversity story. Mountains have major implications for climate, including the creation of glaciers that have significantly shaped Whistler's landscape. As warm air masses from the Pacific rise and cool, precipitation falls abundantly on the west side of the Coast Mountains. Over the past 2.6 million years, when temperatures were low enough and winter snow outpaced summer melt, vast ice sheets covered the area. This model was developed by University of British Columbia with Simon Fraser University researchers to show how ice has advanced and retreated over just part of that time, the last 200,000 years. Our landscape was once almost completely covered in ice, much like Kluwane National Park in the Yukon. Here you can see how rivers of ice carve out deep valleys separated by knife-edge ridges. Current glaciers in the Whistler region store water and release it slowly, contributing to just how habitable this area is for both wildlife and people. As a warming climate increases the rate of melt, however, Whistler's glaciers are rapidly retreating, revealing new landscapes. As the last Pleistocene ice sheet melted, it left behind dramatic landscapes. The nearby Pemberton ice cap is a remnant of the last ice sheet to dominate the area. In the Tantalus range, the dramatic mountains you pass en route from Squamish to Whistler, you can see many formations left by glaciers. Mount Alpha is a noon attack, a glacial horn that stood above the ice during the last glaciation. The ridges between such horns, called arets, indicate the past presence of ice on either side. Here, you can also see a hanging glacier as it retreats up the steep slope. When it was more dominant, the glacier carved a bowl called a cirque, and subsequent melt has filled the bowl to create a tarn lake called, fittingly, Lovely Water. Lake Lovely Water itself resides in a hanging valley perched high above the Squamish River. Howe Sound, on which Squamish is situated, is a fjord carved out during the last ice age. As the ice melted, a rising ocean filled the steep-sided valley. The shallow area at Porto Cove represents a terminal moraine, where debris bulldozed by the last glacial advance was deposited. But these weren't the only things revealed when the glaciers retreated. As glacial ice came and went over time, Volcanic eruptions under, beside, and on top of the ice created globally unique landforms. We can use these fire and ice landforms to better understand when and where the ice was in place. Let's go back to our glaciation model to understand how and when this occurred. Here, we will move forward in time to compare the global sea level curve, a measure of the extent of glaciation, with the local record and timing of ice contact volcanism. Volcanic eruptions that contact ice have identifiable characteristics. And because we can accurately measure the age of crystallized minerals in volcanic rocks, we're able to reconstruct the elevation of ice during these episodes. What did this process of fire meeting ice create? Well, one thing you can notice on the drive from Squamish to Whistler is columnar jointing. When a lava flow crosses the land surface and comes to rest, two cooling surfaces exist, the top of the flow and the bottom of the flow. As the flow cools, it fractures perpendicular to these surfaces, forming vertical columns that are commonly hexagonal in form, nature's way of maximizing the surface area for cooling. Just south of Whistler, however, some joints aren't vertical, but actually curve. That's because these lava flows likely erupted beneath the glacier and flowed through meltwater channels in the ice. These radiating joint surfaces indicate the lava actually cooled in a tunnel of ice. Another example is the table. When lava erupted, it was under ice and couldn't flow across the landscape. So it built a flat-topped mountain. In the same way, lava that formed the black tusk was injected into a glacier, but didn't break through the surface of the ice, which eventually melted away to reveal the tusk. Volcanic eruptions interacting with glacial ice have left a globally unique but fragile landscape across the Sea to Sky region. 
combined with intense specific precipitation and a changing climate, these fragile landforms are especially prone to collapse. Geohazards like landslides are common, frequently closing highway and rail routes. However, in the not too distant past, much larger events occurred. Geologically, a feature known as the barrier represents an especially interesting situation. One truly unique formation resulting from the interaction of fire and ice is Garibaldi Lake. Approximately 11,000 years ago, as the last major glaciation was waning, the Chicamas Valley was full of rapidly melting ice. At that time, Clinker Peak on the shoulder of Mount Price erupted. Lava flowing towards the valley below hit the ice of the lingering Chicamas Valley Glacier. Here, it cooled, damming the mountain valley behind it. Meltwater from the mountains above ponded behind the barrier, where over one trillion cubic meters of water now sit perched at more than 1,400 meters of elevation. Using sonar mapping, we are able to see part of the lava flow that now lies beneath that water. It may look solid, but it actually represents a unique and potentially dangerous situation. The only water exiting Garibaldi Lake year-round gushes from springs at the bottom of the scree slope below the barrier. A consistent flow of water lubricating the bottom of a naturally unstable dam poses a significant long-term geological hazard. In the winter of 1855, a major landslide occurred at the barrier. At the time, there was only a horse trail in the valley. However, if the slide occurred today, it would cover the current Highway 99 and dam the Chicamas River. As a result of geologists studying what happened here and the hazard that remains, the small outpost of Garibaldi Village on Lucille Lake was moved by the BC government in the 1980s. If the barrier did fully collapse, the wall of water it would unleash would cause catastrophic destruction as far downstream as Squamish. However, this is a low probability event for the near future and other hazards are much more imminent. Like Mount Meager, the most restless volcano in Canada, in the valley of the upper Lillooette River. About 2,500 years ago, a major eruption occurred on Mount Meager, throwing out volcanic bombs. Like these pieces of pumice, ash from the eruption made it all the way to Alberta, and since that time, Mount Meager has been collapsing bit by bit. The most recent event occurred in August 2010, when the largest ever landslide in Canada briefly dammed the Lillooet River and threatened widespread flooding in Pemberton. Hot fluids and gases from an old magma chamber beneath Mount Meager are rotting it from the inside out. Over 20 different slopes have been identified as hazardous enough to cause a major landslide, but one that has grabbed geologists' attention is aptly named the Slope of Concern. Pictured here, you can see the rocks are rust-colored, altered by hot volcanic gases. During the summer, when it's not frozen in place, the slope of concern has been measured as moving downward at three centimeters per month. That may not seem like much, but there's an incredible amount of material here. If it collapsed, it could be 10 times the size of the 2010 event. This is a good time to consider the future of the volcano and the lives of those living in its shadow. A few hundred meters from the slope of concern, fumaroles have melted through the Job Glacier and created ice caves. A fumarole is a spot where steam from a volcano reaches the surface. These caves came to the attention of our scientific community a few years ago. Ongoing studies are investigating whether the volcano is reawakening or whether the strong smell of sulfur is merely gas making its way to the surface because of the thinning ice. What else can we expect in the Sea to Sky region in the future? How will geodiversity continue to affect those who live here? While we can't predict the outcome of many of the region's hazards, there's good news on the tourism front. Ongoing development of a Sea to Sky Fire and Ice Geopark. The goal is to achieve greater awareness and stewardship of the landscape through a deeper understanding of its unique and volatile geodiversity. One thing's for sure, this dynamic landscape will continue to provide inspiration to all who live and visit here for generations. After all, 
Geodiversity may be about more than just the rocks beneath our feet, but they're pretty cool too. <laughs>